okay guard show today we have a very two very special guests that we have on the show we're going to be talking about master resiliency training and if you would please introduce yourself and tell us what you do for the oklahoma national guard hi everyone uh i am bonnie smith and i am the sexual assault response coordinator at the 138 fighter wing in tulsa um i am also a traditional uh guardsman on drill weekends i'm an enlisted member and lastly i am also a master resiliency trainer so a couple different hats there i'm jamie van bever and i'm the director of psychological health at the 138th fighter wing um also the suicide prevention program manager and a master resiliency trainer well it sounds like y'all have a lot of experience working with the, the guard being in the guard so you're able to relate your experiences having worked in that capacity to the people that you speak with in the training that you provide. What does it mean to be resilient? I know you, you talk about master resiliency training. Let's look at that word resilient first. Is that something that it's a trait we're born with or do we have to develop over time? Is it kind of like leadership where you're, you hear people are born leaders? Are people born resilient? Well, I, I think that that's a Fantastic question. And I think that there's a lot of different conceptualizations and definitions that are out there talking about resiliency. It seems like a little bit of a like a, a new buzzword in our culture at the moment, but resiliency isn't really a new concept. And for me, the best definition that I like to work from is that resiliency is the ability to thrive despite adversity. That helps me understand it because I think we can have this idea that um, as long as everything's fine in our life, everything's going well, um, we're resilient. And that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it takes some crisis, um, some adversity in our life for us to kind of hone a set of skills that help us to become resilient. Um, and I think also the idea that we're born resilient or when we're not, I think that can be really misleading. So, you know, from a psychology perspective, we begin from a very, very young age to develop the characteristics and the mindsets that contribute to our, our, uh, our ability to be resilient or our ability to kind of move through adversity. And so it can kind of look like some people are like, oh, they're super resilient and they're not. Um, but it's not really somewhere that we arrive. It's more like a continuum. Um, and so it's, it's a... It's a combination of different life experiences, traits, characteristics, and how they kind of intertwine together um, to arrive at a place of resiliency. That's my perspective of resilience. I don't know, Jamie, if you have anything that you would want to add to that. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously all of those things um, are true. And the thing that I would add is that, you know, if you don't feel that you are resilient or that's something that you've ever, um, considered yourself, it's, um, you can learn that. So that's something that, you know, if you feel like, oh, I've always responded in this negative way or in a bad way, or automatically my mind shifts to the negative, which is very normal, um, that it's okay that these are actually skills that can be taught. Um, and so that's very empowering for a lot of people that they feel like, oh, you know, I can learn these skills. I do have these things that I can actually take with me on a day-to-day -day basis to help me throughout my life, my family, my, um, my work situations this deployment, those kinds of things. Adversity is, is something that's very individualistic. The adversity yeah. that I may go through is completely different than, than another person. Is there one type of struggle that someone goes through that may be more difficult than another in general that would require more resiliency? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it does. Um, and I think, you know, we all go through different stuff. And like you said, you know, there's different stress levels. You know, my stress is going to be different than your stress. Someone else's stress is going to be different than the others. But all of these skills can be applied to all of those situations. So whether you're trying to do all of your laundry or something and your washing machine breaks and, you know, you get a call that you got called into work or something like that. And or it could be something, you know, with the COVID situation, we've lost our job, those kinds of things. All of these skills that we teach in the resiliency training can be applied to all of those areas. So there's not really an area of life that it wouldn't apply to. Bonnie, do you have anything to add? Well, yeah, I would just add that we can feel at certain times that we're more resilient in one particular 
particular area of life than another. So maybe, um, you know, if you've gone through like a major relationship change, for example, and you've kind of, you've navigated that and that was certainly, um, um, adversity for a time and, and you kind of worked through some skills and figured out how to manage that, you can be feeling in a place in a new relationship or, you know, in singleness, if, if that is your situation where you're feeling really resilient, yet there's another area, maybe it's your work life that you think this doesn't feel quite as settled for me. I'm feeling there's more conflict. Um, and that's okay. I think that's speaking to those different forms of adversity and it's we're not really able to say, well, this is adversity, you know, top level, number one, and this is uh, number two, number three, in the descending order. But it's really about just the, the individual combination. Okay, so this idea of my struggle is more of a struggle than what you're going through is just a complete myth. Because what it takes to get through that struggle is resiliency, regardless of what that struggle is, because it's all an individual basis. So it's, it's, you can almost equate it to like a pain, pain threshold. What I perceive as a level four on a one to 10 pain scale, maybe somebody's eight. It just depends on the individual. You know, if we look at that from a slightly different lens, we can say that you and I, um, we can go through, say we go on the same deployment and we experience a lot of the same things. Um, what I do with my experiences and what they end up teaching me and how I move through those is going to look very different to how you do. So, you know, one of the things um, that Jamie and I uh, experienced when we went through the master resiliency training course was, um, you know, taking, for example, they showed a photo of a, of a person who looked very sad. They were hands or their faces kind of in their hands and they look very just distraught. And the other one is somebody who appears as though maybe they've just gotten an interview or they've gotten a promotion. And they asked us, which one is the resilient person? And you, you might want to say, well, this person that is obviously achieving great things in their life at the moment, like they're the one that is resilient. But when you dig a little bit deeper, you see they're really at a different place in their resiliency. So one that's, you know, obviously feeling some distress, they're, they're currently working on building that resiliency. <laughs> Where the other one, we're kind of seeing how maybe it's that same individual that's worked through it, and now they're seeing um, growth. They're seeing the pers personal growth, and they've been able to push through. So I, I think that you're exactly right on that, that uh, we can't scale um, crisis. We can't scale distress necessarily in comparing mine to yours. Um, but we can all find ways to push through and, and move in a way that's individual. Is is resiliency necessary for life? Can you live life without being a resilient person? Absolutely not. And I think, again, we, we all have different forms and different levels of resiliency. And like Bonnie said, you know, in one situation, um, I might already have all these experiences and tools to get me through this tough spot. Um, and then sometimes it's a new experience and we need to learn resiliency. But um, we all have a certain extent of re resiliency, right? Um, it's all there. We just sometimes need a reminder of how to get through that or um, some extra tips on how to get through that quicker. Talk to me about the Master Resiliency Training Program. So what is it? What would I learn if I attended the program? Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. The Master Resiliency Training Program is it's it's really it's a program to develop subject matter experts in the field of resiliency. Um, so I guess why is that important? <laughs> why would we need to have people who are subject matter experts in resiliency? Well, we know that military members face a lot of the same challenges that our civilian counterparts face, but we also face a lot some additional ones: deployments, extended work days, often. Um, time away from our families, trying to just, just navigate relationships with those extra barriers. So what we know is that um, military members in particular, or dependents or anyone kind of associated with military, um, we need to find ways to overcome our challenges. So that's some of the reasons why um, the Master Resiliency course was developed. What you would learn if you went is a whole person um, approach to um, developing resiliency in the individual. So it's really kind of focused at uh, frontline supervisors or program managers um, that can identify what's going on at their particular level. So whether that's a wing, a battalion, 
and look at these really unique eight set of skills that look at the whole person um, and figure out what's going to be most relevant for our members. Some people, I think, have the concept that resiliency is about like sitting in your feelings all the time and it's like squishy, right? And it may be, it may be sitting there and thinking, you know, working with someone on, I'm feeling this, I'm struggling with it. What does that mean for me? But it doesn't have to be. One of the good things that, or one of the things that they stressed a lot about as well um, is kind of that open-mindedness as well um, and that psychological flexibility. So, you know, what does that really mean? Well, that means that we have the ability to look at things in a different way too. So it's not always just one way. Um, and so, you know, how do we get out of ourselves or out of our immediate feelings and experiences and kind of look at things in a different way? Um, you know, is there another possibility? Things like that. And those, those skills are very helpful for supervisors, um, everyday people as well. But to, especially when you're supervising people, you can look at things maybe through their perspective, through their eyes to, you know, not just always look at things through your lens. And I think that's that's important to live life that way, not just through your lens, like you said. Take in everybody else around you. Understand that there are other people living in this world besides yourself. And that may help take away some of that struggle that you may be feeling on a daily basis. Do I have to be a certain rank to be able to attend the program? You said uh, supervisors typically... Um, are the ideal candidates? Do I do I even have to be in the military? Can I be a spouse or a veteran to to attend this program? Right. So with the specific mass resiliency training, um, those are specific people at each wing within the Air Force that go to the training um, and that are considered the subject matter experts, right? Um, and so then the role, one of the roles of the mass resiliency trainer is to take this information, take these skills resources and apply them to people in your, um, or offer them to people um, in your units, right? So, and train them to be a resilient resiliency training assistant. So that could be a supervisor, um, enlisted officers. Um, we do have some key spouses that are interested in becoming RTAs, so the resilient training assistants as well. So those, it's really open to lots of different people. Um, you know, Bonnie and I have a lot of people at our wing that are very passionate about resiliency um, and have really enjoyed learning a lot of these skills and a lot of the resources as well. And so we have um, developed a resiliency team that um, people can join and it's open to anyone. So we open it up to spouses and um, to all uh, ranks as well. Um, anyone that's passionate and that wants to help kind of spread the message of resiliency. And you mentioned RTA, Resiliency Training Assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me a little bit about that pro program. Do I have to attend the MRT first or it, how does that all work? So the MRTs train, so the Master Resiliency Trainers train the Resiliency Training Assistant. And so, um, so yes, that is a course very similar to the one that Bonnie and I attended, um, where we teach all the skills to, to the resilient training assistants. So that would be, you know, that we could apply that. If you have an MRT at your wing, then you can um, train for an RTA. Where can I sign up to take the course? Do I need to, to see someone in my unit? Do I have to, is there a cost that's accrued with it? that has to come out of pocket or the unit has to pay for it? For the RTA, so the Resiliency Training Assistants, um, they really work, like Jamie said, with the Master Resiliency Trainer. So um, I would encourage anyone that is interested in becoming an, uh, an RTA um, to just reach out um, to those people at their, um, their unit, their base, and um, find out if you have a Master Resiliency Trainer there already. Um, if you do, then they're able to assist you and they can certify you in that. So Jamie and I are able to certify our RTAs that we work with. Um, if it is a master resiliency trainer qualification that you're interested in, then I would really just encourage everyone to reach out to their chain of command to see what that process um, would look like. When Jamie and I went to this course, one of the things that they really emphasized is, yes, you're a trainer and you're going to teach these skills, but the first step is to role model it. So are you able to practice this? Because people are going to watch you before they're going to listen to you, is my experience. So um, 
I, I guess I'm just throwing that out there to say if there's anybody listening that's like, I would love to get that credential. Well, maybe you want to go through it first and experience some of the RTA um, or the resiliency curriculum before you decide if this is something that you really want to just jump headfirst into. That's a great idea. Kind of with anything, make sure you are able to practice what you are going to preach. Right. Once I've completed the course, what what's next? The you said the master resiliency trainer will have the ability to train the assistants, the RTAs. Um, once I'm in MRT or an RTA, does that mean I am essentially a a counselor in a in a way for my unit for my peers? Not necessarily a, a counselor, maybe a confidant, um, someone that they could go to for advice or um, to to bounce ideas off of or something. Um, a lot of the things that the RTAs are able to be helpful with is to provide additional training um, or briefings or just talks um, to units and to family members as well. So, you know, they might uh, go to a commander's call, for instance, and um, not necessarily teach a skill, but maybe talk about some of the skills um, to kind of promote that resilient um, thinking in the ongoing discussion. So what would be some of those skills that they may brief a commander on or, or talk to their unit about? One skill that we talk about, which is celebrating good news. And you might think that, well, why would someone need to teach me how to celebrate good news? I love celebrating good news. But what we learn um, through practicing the skill and through some of the things that we do in the course is um, we learn that some of us are one-uppers and <laughs> we don't really know it. So when somebody's sharing good news with us, instead of really being able to focus on that individual, sometimes in our desire to connect with them, we're like, oh my gosh, yeah, I did that last year, but when I did it, this happened. Um, it, it's just, it can be very helpful in teaching you how to connect with people and also bring some humor um, into the situation. So not all the skills that you might be working with your commander or your unit on um, are super intense, I guess is just the message I'm trying to communicate here. Some of it is just really, really simple, practical stuff that we can all benefit from. Those are great ones, Bonnie. I appreciate you bringing that up because it is, and that was a really funny part as well. Um, you know, kind of they role modeled and stuff. You know, what does this look like um, if, if you are if you are a one upper, and how to how to prevent that for yourself too? Yeah, that can be a really really sticky thing to do because you want to relate to somebody, especially if you are assisting them in being resilient. So finding that common connection, you you may not have any bad or bad intentions behind your words, but they may be perceived that way. So it would be interesting to learn how to navigate that. When did the Master Resiliency Training Program begin in the military and why did the US military decide to implement something like this? From what I understand, the program really started um, around 2009 and it was led by the Army and in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania. and. Um, my understanding is that it was a response um, to army members who were coming from coming back from rapid deployments and were needing some assistance navigating some of the um, challenges that they experienced there and then coming back to regular life. And there was a gap between the stressors that they had and then the expectations um, that they were going to just sit right back into the seat that they were in before because they had changed, their families had changed. They didn't really know how to navigate that. So, but it was really the idea of the whole person concept. So how do we meet the physical, emotional, the spiritual needs, um, physical needs of our soldiers and airmen? You know, as we all know for the past almost 19 years now, uh, the US military is on a steady deployment rotation to various countries around the world, primarily in the Middle East. So what were, what resources did the military offer prior to MRT? Was there anything there before 2009? And were they just not effective? Is that why they decided to team up with University of Pennsylvania? Well, I think that the University of Pennsylvania work um, around 2005, um, and then they began their partnership with the Army in 2009. Um, and th what they were doing at that time is they were sending the Army members to a course at the University of Pennsylvania, and then they were coming back essentially as a sneeze to their units. But, you know, this training was just for our deployed members. So I, I don't think it's that it was ineffective. I think that we learned that we could all benefit from it. 
So that's, I think, how we've arrived at a total force approach to resiliency. Does that answer your question? 100% it does, because you don't really, you don't understand why these things weren't in place even before the deployment cycle started, because it, right. you look at it now and it almost seems like a common sense approach to a very stressful environment, not just a deployed environment, but being in the military in general, anyone that's ever served can tell you it can be extremely stressful whether you're deployed or not. So having those tools in place can help alleviate a lot of that stress for everybody that's in the ranks. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, if we take a little bit of a, a step back and look at it as well, culturally, I'm not sure that prior to, you know, 2005 or even to, I don't know, yeah, probably 2005 to 2010, that we really understood that, you know, our resiliency, uh, so our, like our mental health is connected to our physical health, um, which impacts our entire resiliency. So I think it's not just a move forward with the military. I often think that the military, we're, on, we're the forerunners on a lot of these matters because we're experiencing them sometimes at a, you know, a, a higher tempo than, than maybe other people are. So uh, I think we have to acknowledge that, that it's kind of an evolution, <laughs> so to speak, an evolutionary program of resiliency as well. And I'm sure if we were to do this podcast um, five years from now, probably wouldn't even be called a podcast, <laughs> but if we were to do this again, we may be asking the same question, like how come in 2020 we didn't have, you know, X, Y, and Z. So, uh, you know, I think we have to kind of celebrate where we've come from and where we're at, but then also realize that we still have a long way to go. Sure. You don't know until you've been put in that situation and in being in that high tempo of deployments, it lends itself to, to those types of things to try and find ways to be innovative in dealing with with the stressors, with the mental health issues that are coming with high deployment tempo. So it's- Sure, it, that's really resiliency in action if we really think about it. Um, we saw that we were experiencing some crisis. We weren't sure how to work them. So what are we gonna do with this experience? Are we gonna continue to do something that isn't ineffective or are we gonna learn from it and push forward? So it's kind of, I don't know, I suppose maybe that's some systematic resiliency. And I would add, you know, with experience comes wisdom. And so, you know, we don't just have this wisdom generically and it, it just appears, you know, um, we have to have some kind of experience to have that wisdom behind that. And I think through these ongoing experiences and these multiple deployments and all of these things that we've had, we found out that not only does it help, you know, um, our deployed members, but it has other broader implications as well. And since that time that it's just really kind of allowed the program to expand from there. What aspects of military service or just the overall mental health of the service member has changed or improved since the implementation of this program? I can speak from my, you know, my own personal experience, and I think it might be kind of normalizing struggle or normalizing that I've gone through something that um, is very difficult. I'm not doing great at the moment and others around us realizing that's OK. Um, and not only is it okay, it's expected. So, you know, if we if we go through some type of trial um, that's serious for us, and then uh, we come back to work and we keep doing what we've always done, we never talk about it, we're like robots, that's really when we would be concerned about somebody. And so um, I think when I look over, you know, I've been in the military for 18 years, and I look back from when I first joined just after 9-11 to today, I think that some of the movement we've made forward has been that we're having these conversations a lot more openly than we were um, when I joined. Um, and I think that's looking at the MRT and, you know, just all the resiliency efforts that are out there right now and how we're implementing those um, like as a broad spectrum. So across whole wings, um, battalions, uh, and we're not medicalizing individuals that are saying, hang on a second, I, I think I'm struggling right now. Can you help me? Um, so we're not kind of ushering people off in the masses, like the problem is you. We're saying, well, no, this is a legitimate issue and it's normal and it's natural that you would be struggling. Let's do this together. Um, 
that's my experience and how I think things have moved forward. And I'm sure that's not everyone's experience, but those are my insights. (laughs) Well, it reiterates the point that you made earlier that, you know, society has changed over time and the military is kind of spurring a little bit of that change. And mental health is one of those things that has come more to the forefront of society and it's becoming normalized and it's no longer a, well, that's just for crazy people. I don't need to go talk to anybody because I'm not crazy. But in reality, everybody can benefit from talking to, to somebody else, regardless of whether you think you're crazy or not, or other people think you're crazy either way. Let's uh, look at an example real quick. Let's say I'm a combat veteran that's hardened from the nature of warfare and resilient through my own personal motivation. I speak my emotions through a series of grunts, yelling, or with enough alcohol to numb a small horse. I think connecting with my feelings is a waste of time. Why should I care about MRT? You know, I would say you do have that choice, right? (laughs) We all have choices. Um, And that's one way um, that you can choose to live, um, but it might not always work for you, right? Or it might not always be the most fulfilling, and it might not be really the way that you want to live. It just might be the easiest thing or what you've experienced or what you know um, to be the way to make choices. But sometimes we feel like, you know, there's there's no other way. There's no hope, um, and we're just so used to responding in that way, um, and that's the good thing about the resiliency is kind of teaching that other way. How else can you um, handle these situations or cope with the situation? Um, how do we move through these feelings a lot quicker? Um, and so I would say that you, if you are that person, then you absolutely are a good candidate for resiliency training. Interesting. Because you would think, you know, well, I'm just going to completely generalize and stereotype here for a second, which is <laughs> not a good thing to do. But A lot of people in the military do have that attitude. I won't say a lot, but there are people in the military that have that attitude. There are people outside of the military that have never served that see military people as that way. I think we all we all have our own personalities and we all have our own way of coping with things and dealing with things. So you could still possibly respond with grunts and groans and yelling and things like that and also be a resilient person. Um, So it doesn't have to change your personality and it doesn't have to change Um, change who you are. And, you know, we certainly wouldn't want anyone, things that are working for them, right? We wouldn't want to like take that away from them and say, no, 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 this is the way you live. This is the way that you respond. Um, And if you don't respond this way, therefore you're not resilient. That's, you know, that, that is not the goal. You know, you should still be able to be yourself and make your own choices and um, respond with grunts and groans if you want to. Um, Because sometimes that works in certain situations, right? Um, But if that is a problem for you and you're feeling like, oh, I really don't want to drink this much alcohol and I actually don't want to yell at my supervisor or um, my friend who's just asking how I am, um, then guess what? There's another way and we have some options. It's always good to have choices, whether it's choice of how I want to respond or a choice in how I can learn how to respond differently. And it's good that you have that there. Yeah. And that is actually one of the skills that we talk about. So kind of creating a space in between um, something that happened, an event, and the way that we're going to respond to it. So we're not reacting, but we're going to respond. So how do we kind of give ourselves a little bit of space to realize actually we do have the option on how we respond and the things that um, are going on? We might have a feeling and we want to yell that out, right? Like we have this feeling and we're frustrated and we want to grunt and groan and yell and stuff. Um, but just realizing that, okay, so that's a feeling that I'm having, but my response can be something separate. Once I've completed my military service, whether it's I do my four years and I'm done, I'm ready to, to hang it up at the house, or I continue on that 20 year path to retirement, How relevant is MRT outside of the military? Does it really only pertain to the situations that we're involving ourselves in in the military? Well, you know, MRT itself, um, and we probably should have mentioned this earlier, this isn't a concept that um, the Army or the Air Force or even the Department of Defense came up with. This actually comes from the the School of Positive Psychology, and it's evidence-based. So I would suggest that, you know, we could argue that transition is probably one of the most challenging times in our lives. 
whether that's a transition from civilian life to military life, from military to civilian, uh, to becoming a parent, a spouse, changing jobs, whatever that transition is, that's going to be a time that we're going to be really challenged. So, you know, we've already talked about that resiliency isn't the absence of stressors or the absence of um, uh, challenges in our life, but it's how we're going to move through it. So um, I, I would suggest that the skills that you gain through the MRT while you're still in the service are going to serve you as well, if not better, <laughs> uh, once you come out the other side of that, regardless of how long you, you, know, you decide that your service is going to be. So does the University of Pennsylvania offer this to people other than the military? Are there civilian companies or almost like a Lean Six Sigma course that's offered to civilians similar to what's offered in the military? So, you know, I don't know if there is a, another course out there on resiliency. I would think that there probably is. But there is a lot of resources available. So you don't necessarily have to go through the MRT to become resilient. There's other resources that are there. One of the great benefits we have being associated with the Army and the Air is that we have this resource. And it, you know, we don't have to go and find it ourselves. We can be coached through that process. I just kind of threw that out there. I wasn't sure because yeah. it just kind of popped in my head. And obviously you y'all can't speak for University of Pennsylvania or DOD I, or the Army or, or Air Force. So I get that. But yeah, I was just curious about uh, if because a lot of what you see, even from like medical treatments, uh, the use of tourniquets on the battlefield has now translated over to using tourniquets in like EMTs now carry them on an ambulance. Yeah. If you're at a if you're at a scene of a crash and somebody is bleeding profusely from their femoral artery, you can slap a tourniquet on there and save their life. They're not just for the battlefield. So if those tools are available for the civilian side currently, or if the MRT is just available for the military. My training, like my clinical training, and, and Jamie probably would speak to this as well, I'm not sure, but um, I spent a lot of time reading about resiliency early on in my training um, and, as a clinical social worker. And uh, it's from everything that I've read, the concept of resiliency really started looking at very young children that had experienced abuse. And some of them, um, despite what they had experienced, were thriving. Well, another portion of these young children who experienced equally horrific abuse um, were not doing so well in life. And so it led, you know, scientists to really ask the social scientists and psychologists to ask the question of why. Why do some people um, continue to thrive under crisis um, and some people don't? And that's where we the kind of early stages of understanding resiliency um, were really born out of. And then from what I have learned, it went from early child study, childhood studies to military, which is interesting because it's kind of two different, you would think, two very different platforms, but we see a lot of similarities in soldiers um, and their ability to thrive and overcome their um, battle experiences. And we think that those people that have tools that are multifaceted, you know, where we talk about these multiple domains of the resiliency training, um, they're able to pull on more resources and have more strengths than, than people that don't spend the time developing them. Bonnie, to kind of piggyback on that, we talk we talk a lot about like evidence-based practices and things like that um, and, and our kind of spectrum of help, helping people and stuff. And what that really means is that um, you can actually replicate these things um, and get the same results, right? So we know that if we um, have a person in this certain situation, and we give them the tools and here's how they respond, then they can expect an equally positive outcome as well. Um, and then the reverse is also true. So if we know that, okay, we don't respond in this way or we don't assist in this way, or this person does not have these tools, resources, access to support, um, it's not gonna be as a favorable outcome, right? So then that's what we talk about. Like this resiliency stuff is not just kind of like um, a, a great idea fairy kind of thing, right? Like, oh, this just sounds great. Yes, let's do that. It actually um, ha it has very strong evidence-based um, science and research behind it. If we already come to the table, right, or we, we go on this deployment or we get in that car and we already have a lot of these tools and resources, 
our brain has kind of figured out a way where to put um, adversity, right? And then what do we do with that? And so then when we are faced with traumatic experiences, whatever they are, like what you're talking about, you know, we call it like a big T trauma or a little T trauma and and mental health, right? And those are um, kind of subjective as well. But, you know, whether we face a big trauma, um, like combat deployment, right? Or a smaller trauma, a dog bite, right? Then if we have a lot of these tools and resources of the resiliency and how do we look at that and stuff, our brain's gonna be able to quickly put that where it needs to go and not necessarily that we would have um, the trauma experience or symptoms that we might have had before. Um, That's a little bit clinical in a way, um, but it is good to know that, okay, well, I don't have to have had and um, a trauma experience or um, big adversity in order to understand what to do with resiliency. It's really great that these are tools that you can take with yourself every day, that you practice them, you learn them, and your brain already knows where to put that. So you might not have as um, as um, an impactful um, response to the trauma that you've experienced. So going off of that, March is Mental Health Awareness Month. If you have gone through the Master Resiliency Training Program, it sounds like you develop a lot of tools, not only for yourself, or even going through the assisting program. You have a lot of tools for yourself, but you have uh, ways that you can help other people through the difficulties, the adversity that they may be going through in their life. So with that said, would you consider someone who has completed the Master Resiliency Training Program a superhero? Because they now have this superpower of helping somebody through their adversity or overcoming their adversity. And why why or why not would you call them a superhero? I think that's such a fabulous question. I love that. Um, I think that it is a challenging question though because I've completed the course and I certainly do not consider myself a superhero by any shape or form. (laughs) However, you know, if we look at what is a superhero, I really, maybe need to think about that. Well, I think a superhero is a person with a unique set of skills, like you said, that is willing and able to help another. So if we think about it like that, maybe we can say that RTAs and MRTs can be superheroes. But I think if we use that same definition, we look all around us at the military, we are surrounded um, by people who have unique set of skills that are able and willing to help others, you know, especially when we look at like all this stuff going on with COVID-19 and we're looking at our healthcare workers and our emergency responders. I think that, uh, I think we're probably surrounded by superheroes if we're really honest with ourselves. Yeah. And the impact of, you know, being an MRT, but just even being a resiliency trainer or someone that has gone through the course, it doesn't have to be grandiose and it doesn't have to be huge macro that I've made all of these policy changes or, you know, I spoke and 5,000 people were trained and now they, you know, know or whatever. It can be simply in like day-to-day interactions. And if it's something that truly uh, positively impacts your life or the life of someone else, then um, that's a that's a really great thing. And um, so, yeah, however you want to define yourself as a superhero or um, if, if that helps um, other people, then certainly so. But again, I'm with Bonnie. Um, <laughs> I would not consider myself a superhero um, by any stretch. (laughs) So once you complete the course, you get a certificate, but you don't get a cape. You don't get the Lycra. That's what you're saying. Correct. You wouldn't. And actually, if you could choose, I would not choose to be a superhero. I would choose to be an (laughs) X-Men. Jean Grey. Thank you. As you said, everybody can be a superhero in their own right because everybody has their own individual set of skills. And if they use them to help people, then yeah, by definition, you would be a superhero. That's great. I like that. So we we talked a little bit about uh, how mental health and physical health are connected. Talk to me a little bit more about that connection. How does my mental health impact my physical health? And is one more important than the other? Should I, should I have a good balance of both or should I put more attention to my mental health that will in turn impact my physical health or vice versa? Is there a connection between this physical health and the mental health? Absolutely. Um, research shows that as well, um, that we know that if we're not uh, physically healthy, 
we're also not going to be mentally healthy, right? And and vice versa, um, because the brain is part of our body and it's an organ. And so, you know, we got to be um, kind to it as well. And so the more that we can help to um, reframe the way that we think about things or the way that we respond to things is going to make us overall healthier. We're going to have a more positive outlook. We're going to be looking for the good, um, those kinds of things. And so it is very important, um, you know, we know that um, we can recreate new pathways in our brain. So, you know, our automatic thought might not be something that's negative. It's going to be something positive. But the way that we can overcome that is by simply practicing it. And so the more that we do that, the healthier that we become. Um, also, when we feel really good about ourselves and our decisions, we're, we're actually going to want to take care of our bodies a little bit better, right? We're going to want to drink that water. We're going to um, continue our commitment to take a shower every day or whatever it is, you know, um, we're going to want to exercise. Um, and so, and then, you know, obviously there's all kinds of research out there too about the benefits of physical um, activity and the positive impacts that that has for your mental health. Um, you know, how, we talked a little bit about trauma um, earlier. And so trauma and stress-related reactions, and that gets stored in our central nervous system in our body, right? And so how do we get that out? The way that we get that out is through physical activity. That helps our body metabolize those trauma and anxiety responses. So being a resilient person, it, it does, it sounds like it does impact your mental health. That resiliency is going to make it easier for you to overcome those obstacles, that adversity, like we've talked about. So would I only need that type of resiliency training if I suffer from depression or if I'm having suicidal thoughts? Are they only, is, is the training only for that, uh, that demographic of people? Do I need to focus that much on resiliency if I don't suffer from depression, if I don't have suicidal thoughts? Well, I don't know. I don't think that's the case at all. I, I think what we have to remember is that from a clinical standpoint, um, generally nobody just wakes up one day with suicidal thoughts and clinical depression, right? So there's a great deal of thoughts, emotions, and experience that one would battle with before they would be in a place such as that. So, you know, research shows us that the thoughts and the emotions that we um, give our fuel to, that we give the most amount of time, most amount of energy, that's what we tend to recreate. If somebody is having those those types of thoughts, we have to recognize that um, there's a lot of energy going on there for them, right? So if we're able to, to recreate some positive and be a little more proactive, so if we become, excuse me, if we start addressing our resiliency, before we get to those places, then we're going to be able to, number one, hopefully stop them a lot quicker and be able to step up and ask for help and recognize the really early signs that hmm, maybe I'm not okay. Maybe this is a little more serious so that, so that we don't, we don't come to that crisis point. Right. Um, if we do though, there is still help available. So I would say that really when we're talking about developing our resiliency skills, we want to look at them from like a proactive approach like Jamie was talking about. We don't necessarily need to come back from the deployment to say, oh, okay, well now there might be an issue. We want to be kind of preparing ourselves constantly in that look ahead of, you know, how do I prepare myself for what's coming next in life? Because we know there's roadblocks in life. We know there's bumps in the road. We know we're going to have some, um, you know, we're going to have some mountains that we're feeling really great on. And we're going to also have some valleys. So um, the hope would be that we are able to develop some resiliency skills so that when we are in those valleys, we can bounce back or we can push through um, a little bit quicker had we not have had those skills. That's right. You know, we don't stay stuck in that space, right? So like, we're still going to have those um, challenges and negative experiences and we might be someone that does have clinical depression um, and that's okay. So these resilient skills help us not stay stuck and that, um, that feeling or emotion or anxiety or frustration or um, that situation that we're in, it helps us be able to move out of that quicker. Yeah. And I think if you are, ex you know, if we are experiencing depression or suicidal thoughts, I don't think we then say, oh, well, I failed. I'm not resilient. 
that's not the case. It's what do we do with it from there? So that's that continuum that we keep coming back to. So where is my resiliency in this moment? Is it is it doing well? Am I feeling like I'm pushing through my barriers or actually do I need a little bit of help right now? Um, yeah. <laughs> great point, great point. So if I feel like I am being responsible uh, in maintaining my mental health, I've been going to the VA or a civilian counselor for years, maybe I'm taking medication for depression, anxiety, or some of the things that I've had to deal with on deployments that I've been on. Uh, and I, f I feel better. I feel like I'm able to approach the world and it, those things don't weigh me down anymore. Why would something like this still be relevant to my life? There's a difference too between um, a disease process, you know, uh, a medical diagnosis, a clinical depression versus um, a sad time in our life, right? Um, and so even if we are that person that's going to the VA, um, going to a counselor, is on medication and is on the right path and is feeling better, perfect, that's great. You know, maybe these are some tools and resources that you can help and share with someone else um, or, or you know, maybe there is a situation that you're coming up against and you're still in counseling and you're still taking your medication and something bad happens. Uh, that doesn't mean that all of that stuff, the counseling, the medication and all of that isn't working um, and we're not resilient. No, it just means that, you know, hey, are there other things that I could be looking at? What are some other tools and resources that I can use um, to help me not stay stuck in this tough time forever or not as long? One of the skills that we teach um, in our resiliency is we touch on mindfulness and the importance of that. Um, we have so much more research now on the importance of mindfulness, the importance of calming our minds, um, centering ourselves. We have a lot more research on that, um, evidence-based research as well. And one of the things that they have found with people that um, do have very good, consistent mindfulness practices, we consider themselves someone that um, is maybe good at meditation and stuff. We actually do have um, research that shows us that they did a study um, on pain responses and people that don't meditate and people that do meditate or, or mindful mindfulness practice. Um, and you know, they told them, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna hurt you. We're gonna give you a little shock, that kind of thing." Um, and then they also said the exact same thing to people that had a mindfulness practice, right? Um, and so when they would um, initiate the pain. The people that don't have a mindfulness practice had um, a lot more anxiety leading up to the pain and during the pain response and their recovery time from that pain response was a lot longer than the people that practice mindfulness. So what that tells us is that um, the people that don't have that uh, mindfulness practice don't really kind of have that brain training, right? To say, okay, I'm no longer in this scary, painful situation. Um, people that have a mindfulness practice and that are able to look at things in a different way actually were able to say, you know what, that pain is not physically there anymore and now I'm safe and I'm okay. Um, and so that is not the full spectrum of the resiliency training program by any means, but it is something to, you know, I think a lot of us like to, to have actually actual science um, that's based in our decisions too, you know, so it's like, okay, no, we can actually look at the research and we know that um, people that do practice these skills actually have very positive, um, reproducible, um, measurable, uh, positive outcomes. What is mindfulness? We, we, we've talked all around it, but I think, can you define that for me? So mindfulness is really, you know, being able to um, to kind of put things aside and to make a space and make a commitment to being able to be in the present. So it's all about being in the present. You know, a lot of the time that we spend um, just in our thinking brain, right, is um, and we're worrying or we're kind of ruminating, thinking too much about running over events that happened in the past. And we're worried about things that are going to happen in the future. And very few of us actually stay in the present. Like, okay, so, you know, Oh, I'm worried about how I'm going to pay my bills, which is a is a valid concern, right? But we stay there for a long time. Whereas, you know, um, when we talk about mindfulness, it's okay. So we might have that thought of I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills next week, or I'm worried I'm going to lose my job, or I have this cancer diagnosis, and we worry about that a lot, and we think about the future of that. But people that are able to practice mindfulness and the 
um, motivation is that we need to figure out a way that we can stay in the present, you know? So yes, things are, bad things will happen. Um, bad things could happen, but am I safe and am I okay right now? Um, so it helps us to be able to recenter ourselves, um, and to kind of calm our brain. You know, when I hear mindfulness at first, like in school or, um, in trainings, I would just roll my eyes because I'm not a person that is, um, Oh, let's everyone sit down. We're going to hold hands and we're going to sing Kumbaya. Like, I don't have time for that. I'm not interested in that. And so, you know, that's kind of what I thought a lot about, but it's important to know that it's actually just reminding yourself to be in the present. So, you know, whether that's, you have a lot going on, you're worried about something that happened in the past, but right now I am having my piece of chocolate, which is what I like to, you know, have a little mindfulness practice of, of you know, have my little dove dark chocolate with almonds and every day I eat that and I just savor it and I appreciate it, you know? Um, and so those are the things that, you know, how can we stay in the present? Um, and when we talk to people and when I talk to people too about developing a mindfulness practice, so many of us think, how can I sit there for five minutes and not think about anything? And the answer is you can't, we're always going to be thinking about stuff. But if we kind of bring ourselves back to a commitment, okay, I've committed for five minutes to, um, to think about, you know, to be here and to try to quiet my mind. And when I notice my mind drifting, I'm just going to recognize that my mind is drifting and I'm going to bring it right back to the present. So can I focus on my breathing for five minutes? Um, can I just be present in the here and now for five minutes or however long that, um, that you would like to start that. So those are the things that we talk about when we talk about mindfulness, just being very mindful of where you're at in this present moment. I love the way that the MRT describes uh, mindfulness, Jamie, and, and it's exactly like you've just described. It. I think he's like, you could have written the book on it. <laughs> Such a great job describing it. But they talk about it as a, a pendulum that's going side to side. And on one far end, you have dwelling on the past. On the other far end, you have worry about the future. And then right down there in the middle in that golden spot is the, you know, staying present in this moment, which is what, you know, Jamie just talked about. And um, it's rare that we keep ourselves right here. And I love that, you know, when we're talking about resiliency on the, on this, this particular curriculum, um, they address that there is a time to dwell in the past and there is a time to be thinking and planning for the future, but it's very difficult to be healthy on those two far ends if we're not able to ground ourselves right here in the middle for for a time, you know, like Jamie talked about that five minutes and um, I thought I would just share, like I've been working on this mindfulness thing for many years, but you know, a tool that I have found really helpful uh, is I need like a prop to ground me. So um, a coffee cup, if I just hold my coffee cup, it seems to help me stay like in the present. I can feel it. If I feel my mind drifting, I can smell it. I can engage all my senses right here on this cup. I can open my eyes and I can see the steam coming out of my cup. It sounds like for Jamie, it's that chocolate, that taste that she's getting. Other people really benefit from like taking their shoes off and just holding them flat against the ground and then maybe moving them back and forth. That way you're just staying in, what am I feeling right now? What's happening for me in this moment? Instead of when is my five minutes up? Because I need to call the insurance company and then I got to make that, I got to respond to that email. And so we're already living five minutes from now. So, um, you know, we've talked a lot about mindfulness in these couple of moments, but how does that link back to our resiliency? So we've talked a little bit earlier about the more time and the more energy we put towards a particular thought, we tend to recreate that, right? So if we're sitting here in this present and we're not thinking about the million things we did wrong last week, um, beating ourselves up for, you know, not responding to that phone call on time or whatever it may be and then worrying about the future, we're able to kind of have that little bit of peace. And research shows us also not only does it help us um, manage pain, there's also a lot of evidence that it helps with physical health health outcomes that we discussed and sleep. So there's a lot of really good reasons why being mindful um, helps with our resiliency. If you if you are aware of the current moment that you're in, you're conscious of just that, just the awareness that you have, like you said, holding your coffee cup, smelling the coffee, seeing the steam rise, engaging all of your senses and all of the awareness that you're surrounded by 
that is being mindful. And that is the only thing that you have to worry about at that one specific moment. The difficult part is trying to do that all day long. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's true. You know, and that, that, that is, you know, when we think of mindfulness too, you know, some people think about it as mind training. So we want to be able to have the voluntary control um, or to control um, our responses. And so, you know, the more that we can train ourselves and train our brain um, to be able to kind of come back to the present, to remind where you're at, um, the, the better outcomes that we're going to have when we do face um, adversity and difficult times. Obviously, this interview is not in person. We're having to do this via Zoom uh, because of this pandemic that is affecting the globe. So since March, we've all found ourselves living in this world of uncertainty uh, because of the pandemic. What are ways that we can use resiliency to get through what we're experiencing collectively? When we're going through a global pandemic and nothing is kind of functioning at its usual level, it's unrealistic to expect that we would be as well. So um, I think that addressing some of these resiliency skills, so one of them is, you know, we've mentioned the physical wellness. Um, I'll be really transparent and just, you know, last night trying to multitask my, you know, my family commitments and my work commitments and just a million other things, you know, I couldn't get groceries. So they took all the, all my chicken and my ground beef. They took everything off of my grocery list. I'm like, what am I going to feed these five little children in my house? I was feeling well in that moment. Like I was not mindful. I was not in the present. I was in next Friday when I don't have any food <laughs> in my refrigerator. Right. <laughs> and, um, I had to stop myself. I had to kind of time out and I told my husband, you know, I'm feeling really stressed. I'm going to go for a run because that's not what I wanted to do in that moment. I wanted to, to be like the, you know, that person we were talking about earlier that sat and just grumbled and complained. Right. That's what I felt like doing is like, woe is me. This is all too hard. I don't want to do it right now. Right. But because I have this skill set, I had a choice. So I got up, I went for a run, and I came back and was able to reset. So I, in that moment, benefited from, from this set of resiliency skills that we've learned. So that didn't mean that my stressors went away. <laughs> when I came back from my run, I had to sit back down and deal with all of them. But I wasn't overwhelmed by them because I was able to step away for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many, so many of those skills that are helpful, you know, and had um, had we not had those skills and tools and resources and stuff before, we probably would have responded in the way that, you know, um, that our automatic would have been, right? Our feeling brain wanted us to respond in this way. And so that's what we're going to do. But recognizing that way, taking a second, and, you know, okay, yeah, actually we do have the power of choice right now. And, you know, one of the options that I'm going to go with is this, you know? And so I think those kinds of things are helpful. Again, it doesn't diminish our impact of, or the, um, the impact of the adversity and the stresses that we're experiencing. It just gives us a little bit more tools to be like, oh, wait, just a second, hold on. Let me put a little bit of space in the way that I'm responding and stuff and figuring out what are some tools and resources that I already have um, to help me during this time. What positives do you see coming out of all of this? There's a lot of stress that people are, are uh, experiencing on a daily basis. Even with people going back to work, there's still a massive part of the population that's unemployed. People are or have lost money from having their hours cut from work or for being laid off. Uh, and even going back to work with some people wanting to approach the situation this way and the other people want to approach it this way and nobody really knows. How can we seek or what positives do you see coming out of out of all of this? Personally, what I hope that everyone comes um, out of this with is just an appreciation that things don't always have to look a certain way. And when things look really bad and when bad things happen, what do we do with that? Um, where do we go from here? And um, realizing that, you know, we do have the power of choice and we don't have the power of, and control over all of our circumstances, but we do have the power and control over the way that we respond to them. And so that I hope that everyone can take away from this that, you know, things might look a little different. They might sound a little different, smell a little different, all of that. Um, and that's okay, that we're still going to find a way 
to work together, to stay together, to, um, to work through this, to get through this difficult time. And we can do that. One thing I've been encouraged in seeing, um, seeing as a positive coming out of all of this is um, the use of, it sounds like kind of what you're describing, Jamie, you know, flexibility and creativity and how we're uh, tackling the tasks and responsibilities that we have. I think I've, I've read a study that American volunteerism is at an all-time high. So that's really encouraging to me that we realize that, you know, we can step in and we can fill the needs of some of our our neighbors, our colleagues, our friends and family. Um, that's really encouraging to see as a culture that we're doing that. Um, I think for me personally, uh, a positive that I hope that we take away from this is just an increase in our compassion for one another. Um, I think it can be, we, you know, by design or, you know, uh, our need for survival, we can sometimes be quite focused on ourselves and our own needs. And I've been really encouraged by how, you know, people who I don't talk to all the time have reached out to me or asked how other people are doing that they don't normally connect with. So, um, yeah, I think maybe just becoming more compassionate, empathetic to the struggles that people around us are, are really uh, facing and saying, you know, I'm sorry that that's happening to you. Can I help you in any way? And not so judgment based. Well, you should have done this or had you have done this and you wouldn't be where you are and just um, maybe just being a little more graceful and gentle with one another, I hope is an outcome from all of this. No, I agree with you. One thing that I hope for is people are more compassionate towards other people. Human beings can be actual genuine human beings to one another rather than always on the defense because they feel like somebody's taking advantage of you or just the opposite, feeling like you have to take advantage of other people. And this is really hopefully put people's minds in a different perspective, a different way to look at humanity as a whole and that we're really all in this together, whether it's a pandemic or it's going to the grocery store, which is a chore these days. But I, I think a lot of that may be kind of normal down the road for a little while anyways. So what are some resources that our guardsmen and their families can go to for uh, more information about the MRT program or just additional help with their personal health and wellness? If anyone wants to learn more about the MRT program with um, the Air Force or some other resiliency options um, and resources, they can contact Bonnie or I um, if you're a National Guard member through the, uh, the Global. So we have our emails listed there and our phone numbers. So please don't hesitate to reach out. If you or your family has any questions, we'd love to help you out. Um, also, the Air Force website has a resiliency um, tab with a lot of great resources as well. Um, and there's even specific information for families, um, yeah, for spouses and families, and it has a lot of great practical tips as well. Yeah, I would also just add, um, encourage everybody to take a look at the Oklahoma National Guard website and check out the crisis services and see if there's anything um, there that uh, will answer your questions. There's also the military crisis line um, that anybody is welcome to give a call if they're needing assistance. Uh, we have Military One Source, the DOD Safe Line, and as always, you can contact your chain of command for um, more information, and they can make sure that you get plugged into the correct agency. Jamie Van Bever, Bonnie Smith, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all this information that you've given us, and hopefully people that are listening or watching can take this information and go through the program, the Master Resiliency Training Program, get that superhero cape that's invisible, but they're still able to get out there and use those superpowers to help other people around them. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. The OK Guard Show is produced by the Oklahoma National Guard Public Affairs Office. Any mention of products or brands does not imply endorsement. All guests on the show are volunteers in an effort to inform and educate members of the Oklahoma National Guard, their families, retirees, potential recruits, and the community.